Hands up, don't shoot. That was the mantra for many protesters from almost the very beginning of the Michael Brown case. But in an article titled The Ferguson Fraud, one author looks at why Brown would still be alive today if that phrase reflected the reality of what happened and suggests the entire argument that this grand jury case was rigged is flawed as well. So let's talk about it with Judge Alex Ferrer, host of Judge Alex and a retired Florida Circuit Court judge. Great to see you tonight, sir. Oh, it's great to be with you, Shannon. Thank you. All right, I want to ask you a couple of questions because of your experience, not only as a judge, but prior to that as a law enforcement mm -hmm. officer as well. Um, let's talk a little bit about how this works uh, when an officer is you know, put before a grand jury or the case is put before a grand jury. There's been a lot of criticism um, that a special prosecutor wasn't appointed or even the fact that the officer testified. Uh, in this article that we re referred to called The Ferguson Fraud, um, there are a lot of points made about the fact that, you know, in a grand jury setting, somebody who testified who is in danger of being indicted, they don't get an attorney, and anything they say can be used against them. So for you, what does that say about the officer's decision to testify? Well, either way, it's a risky decision because whether he um, w was right in using justifiable use of deadly force or was wrong in using deadly force, um, you still have a federal investigation hanging out there from a Department of Justice that really has seemed a bit partial towards getting some type of uh, conviction or some type of charges or some type of some type of something from the police department itself or from the officer so it's still risky for him to do that so he must have some he must be pretty confident i would say about the outcome of it i, I will agree that it is unusual for a defendant any defendant not just a police officer but any defendant to uh, voluntarily you know testify in front of a grand jury um, and it's also a little unusual the way it was done. Now, granted, grand juries across, this, across the country have different rules, and grand juries are investigative bodies as well as being uh, um, bodies that determine whether or not probable cause has come out and some uh, has been reached. In some places, grand juries launch their own investigations into whatever they want. But what I took from the way this was presented, because the public, uh, some of the criti uh, criticisms I've heard were that the prosecutor really didn't, you know, take the lead, didn't ask the jury, the grand jury for any particular charges. Honestly, prosecutors have an ethical obligation, and they are prohibited ethically from bringing charges in a case where they do not believe they can prove it beyond every reasonable doubt. That is one of the many protections we have to make sure that an innocent defendant does not go to prison. So they certainly have an ethical obligation not to bring a case that they don't believe rises to the level of probable cause. And I suspect, and this is just me speculating, that McCullough in this case, after he realized that the initial witnesses, because you remember, Shannon, the witnesses at the beginning, six or seven or eight, were saying he shot him in the back, he had his hands up, he was surrendering, he stood over his body and, and pumped rounds into him. As the evidence came out, the forensic evidence that doesn't lie, uh, showing that that was not true, as witnesses came forward, African-American witnesses, so we can kind of remove the, the claim of any racism in the witness's mind, uh, and said, I saw him turn around and charge the officer like a football player, and I, I will as you know, be up front with you, I haven't gone through the 70 hours of testimony. So some of it I've, I've seen and some of it I'm relying on the prosecutor having released it to everybody and told everybody what's in it. I suspect that McCullough realized not only can't I prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt, but I don't think I can even charge here because this is a justified shooting. And I think that realizing that he knew from the beginning there was criticism about him being the prosecutor because his father mm -hmm. had been murdered by an African-American man and there were demands that another prosecutor be provided. So I think he realized, you can imagine, if I decide not to prosecute what they're going to think, and he turned it over to the grand jury, probably in its investigative capacity, to say, look, here's everything. Here's the good, the bad, and the ugly. Here are the witnesses that, that said originally his hands were up, and now many of them have recanted, and many of them have admitted that they didn't see it. Um, and here are the witnesses who are saying it, it went the way the officer did. Here's the forensic evidence that shows well, Michael Brown's DNA on the officer's gun. Now, if mm -hmm. all of this is true, um, 
I think he and was we, just trying to say, it's not me. Right. It's and, not and, me. It's the evidence. And we know that the grand jury was convinced of that, having seen, uh, you know, you Absolutely. said uh, 70 hours of testimony. They've seen all the physical evidence, including the autopsy that was requested by the family, um, in addition to the one that was done by, you know, government uh, agents. Uh, but so people understand the, the level that the grand jury would have to get to to say, we now indict this officer, much lower than what you actually have to present at trial. And it, and it sounds yes. like you, you talk about McCullough working through that process, knowing he wasn't going to get a conviction. I mean, it, just to get past the grand jury is a much lower level. Much lower. I mean, it's just probable cause. It's a level that, requ that is required for a police officer to make an arrest. Probable cause. And th in order to convict them, he's got to prove it beyond every reasonable doubt. So it is a very low standard. And another thing is, remember that the public looks at this and says, oh, my God, it's an unarmed man. Well, mind you, Michael Brown was a six foot six, 285 pound man. The police officer, I think, was tall himself. He was about six four, 210, not, not, not nearly as heavy. Uh, but he's sitting in a police car. He's just been assaulted, according to the physical evidence uh, on the scene. He's been physically assaulted in the police car by Michael Brown, okay? The police officer doesn't know how far Michael Brown's going to go. Michael Brown knows how far he's going to go, mm -hmm. but the police, as a police officer, and I was a police officer, right. you don't know how far this this person is willing to go. If he gets my gun, is he going to pump six mm -hmm. rounds in my chest, or Which is he, happens. or is he going to just run away with it? Right. Uh, I want to very quickly play a little bit of uh, what Officer Wilson had to say about remorse uh, about the death of Michael Brown, and then quickly get your reaction. Sure. I'm sorry that their son lost his life. It wasn't the intention of that day. It's what occurred that day. And there's no, nothing you can say that's gonna make a parent feel better. It sounds like you don't think you were responsible. I did my job that day. Do you feel any remorse? Everyone feels remorse when a life's lost. Like I told you before, I never wanted to take anybody's life. You know, that's not the good part of the job. That's the bad part of the job. So, yes, there is remorse. And that was from the exclusive ABC interview. Um, speaking from an officer's perspective, Judge, um, that's got to be the last thing you ever want to see happen on your uh, line of duty. Well, regardless of what happens, you have to carry that decision the rest of your life. You just took somebody's life. I've had the uh, unfortunate opportunity to sentence two people to death. I did what I had to do. I knew it was the right punishment. But I still think about it. You're, you're starting the wheel of of ending somebody's life, um, it's got to be much, much harder when you actually pulled the trigger that ended somebody's life, especially an 18-year-old. And my heart goes out to the family mm -hmm. of Michael Brown. My, my parents lost two sons. I know how horrible it is and what a hole it leaves in your life. Um, but, you know, th th you, two wrongs don't yeah. make a right. And, you know, in this case, it's not even a wrong. I, I honestly see if the evidence was the way it is, the, per, uh, Told the, mm -hmm. um, if the evidence is the way that we're told it is, the shooting would be justifiable. Yeah, even though it, it is absolutely tragic that anyone would lose a child. Judge, thank you very much. Great to see you and happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving to you too. Well, Michael Brown's mother speaking out moments ago, what she has to say about her husband's actions after the decision came down on the streets with all the protesters. Plus, President Obama has called for calm in Ferguson, but then added it's not really his job to comment, quote, on ongoing investigations and specific cases. But why has he done that just now and a whole lot of times in the past?